Three, two, one, here we go. Rain Man's Take Podcast. Observations on the world we live in. My take on current events and other topics of interest. Also, interviews with some really cool people. So let's get the conversation going. Hey everybody, it's the Rain Man. Just want to give a quick shout out to everybody watching. Thank you very much. I know you're going to find this next interview thought provoking. I enjoy spending time with people like my next guest and getting into more detail about the subject matter. And I know you appreciate that as well. So go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe. That way we can continue bringing you great content in the future. So thanks again for being part of Rain Man's Take and enjoy the interview. Hey everybody, it's the Rain Man. I want to welcome my guests, CC King and Casey Davis. Guys, how are you doing today? Doing great, thank you. Doing great, thanks. Well, thanks for joining me. And the reason why I wanted to have them on, they are part of a very interesting organization called Diabetes Research Connection. Now, um, CC King was actually the co-founder, and I believe it was started in 2012. Is that right, Casey? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, so he's the co-founder of, uh, of the DRC, and he's also the leader in the Molecular Assemblies Group Genomics Institute of the Novartis Research Foundation. And Casey is the current uh, Senior Director of Development over at the DRC. So I wanted to have them on because uh, I was talking to CC a, uh, a couple of months ago about this program, and it's something that I've never heard of that I thought was a very cool uh, concept, and I wanted to kind of dive into it a little bit deeper. So, guys, thanks very much for, uh, for, for joining me today. And why don't we start with you, uh, CC, giving me a little bit of your background and how uh, the DRC came about. Sure. Um, so, I have a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Tennessee in Memphis. I moved to California about 25 years ago to do a postdoctoral fellowship at the Scripps Research Institute. From there, I moved over to um, UCSD, where I did a second fellowship and then established my own lab. And that's where I became involved with Alberto Hayek and the type 1 diabetes community. Um, during, I guess, the early 2000s, um, I was very involved in a bunch of really technical science that Alberto recognized could play a pretty significant role in understanding how human islets, which are the cells that produce insulin in your body, are um, regulated. And so we kind of teamed up and from there, I wound up um, working with him for the next 15 years or so and until he retired and then took over his lab. And so he's the one who really drew me into the type one world. And I was able to apply most of my scientific um, sort of technology-based aspects to that while at UCSD. Um, I spent most of my time there looking at developing um, cell-based therapeutics for type one diabetes. In other words, how to take human embryonic stem cells and differentiate them into insulin producing cells. About four years ago, I decided, or three years ago, I decided that I wanted to switch courses and really become more involved in drug discovery and try for the remainder of my career to work to get a drug um, moved from idea into patients. And so that's where I moved to GNF, which is part of Novartis. And I, but I didn't leave behind my diabetes world. Um, I've stayed active in the community and my role with David and Alberto and Nigel Calcutt, who was the fourth member who helped start this, has remained strong. So I remain part of the diabetes and type one community because of that. And I'm very lucky to work with such a talented group at the Diabetes Research Connection, both board and staff. So, um, Obviously, you are the uh, the research side of it, and if you ever look at his CV, it's about ten pages long. With it's just incredible. Uh, and so, Casey, you are you are on the fundraising side of the DRC. Kind of tell me a little bit about your background and how you got involved with DRC. Yeah, sure. My CV is not ten pages long. I just have a good old traditional <laughs> resume. Um, but yeah, I've been working in the nonprofit sphere or sector here in San Diego since I graduated college in 2010, so the past 11 years. 
Um, I was originally in local nonprofits that were focused more on community service. Um, we did some advocacy with local organizations that focused on more like sexual assault survivors and, and things of kind of that nature. And when I found myself getting burnt out in my early 20s serving in social services, I decided to transition over to fundraising, which that is not people's number one choice. <laughs> A lot of people don't like to raise money um, or they think it's about asking for money, but I think philanthropy is so much bigger than that. And really my philosophy is to engage a community in real ways to have a solution towards a problem, right? I mean, because that's what nonprofits are created for, to solve problems in our society that perhaps the government <laughs> isn't. So um, I think for me, how I ended up with, with Diabetes Research Connection, I love fundraising. I started to get over into the healthcare arena, uh, if you will, a few, I think now, well, with COVID last year, I feel like my years are really off. Um, I guess it's still this year, <laughs> but I, 2017, 18, I kind of transitioned over there and I began consulting with the Diabetes Research Connection, knew someone on leadership and actually helped with their first annual event. So it's a dance for diabetes. We had it in 2018. And it was a huge success. I think it raised half of our organization's revenue that year. Um, so really exciting, was really fun. And I had an interview within 30 days of that event and was offered the full-time position and have been working with everybody at, at DRC ever since then. Love it here. And as you said, there's such innovative ways to fund research through DRC, through crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, which is exciting. So it's a new challenge and a new sphere. I personally don't have a connection with type one diabetes outside of this community. When I was serving as more of like an event coordinator and I was really just doing coaching, fundraising, coaching and consulting, I fell in love with the people, um, just started to really see moms, um, dads, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles who have family members impacted with type one. And then also a lot of our board members and donors have type one and seeing what they go through day to day and thinking, wow, we really need to find a cure. You know, we need to do something towards this. So I've loved working with this community and, and still enjoy doing so. So how big is the population in America that has type one diabetes? I mean, is it huge? It's 1.6 million has type one diabetes. Hmm. Okay. And then, um, and forgive me here for, for my ignorance in, in, in this, is that, is that, is that the baseline diabetes? Is that the worst? Are there, are there ranges? What's the... So, so, so let me go in and make a little quick distinction because um, one of the things that we are is we're focused on a subset of all of the diabetes population. So type 1 diabetes used to be known as what's called juvenile diabetes, which is not related to diet, obesity, uh, lifestyle. Uh, obviously, it is related some to genetics, but type one is more of an autoimmune disease. So it is something that normally attacks, normally attacks early in life. And um, it's where the uh, T cells in the body come in and kill the insulin producing beta cells. They're the only cells in the body that produce it to any, degree, any large degree and are responsible for maintenance of blood sugar. So this is not the typical, um, this is not the typical um, epidemic uh, type side of diabetes. This is the autoimmune uh, genetic T cell side of it. And these are, these are uh, children, are they born with it? Do they develop it early in life? What's the... Uh... Well, so that's a great question. Um, normally it manifests sometime in early childhood. Friends, close friends of ours had it develop in, you know, early childhood, five to 10 years old. I think that's when a lot of our board members who've been with it have had it. However, I know of clinical cases where the onset hasn't been until the 80s. Um, my cousin was diagnosed at 31, which is on the older side. So there are certainly a range, but normally it strikes between, I would say, five and 15. Got it. Got it. And uh, before we get into exactly what we're going to be doing here, folks, take this down. It's diabetesresearchconnection.org. You can go on that website. It'll tell you everything you need to know about uh, the donation process and what they're actually doing over at the DRC. So, uh, Casey, 
this is the one thing that I thought was really cool because like we were talking about before uh, CC got on, I always pictured, uh, you know, medical research would be funded by the private sector, by venture capital or private equity guys that see a product that they, th or see a concept that they think is a great idea. They invest in it. And then we go from there. Whereas this is, you have researchers out there who are literally looking for like micro amounts of money relative to, to what you would think about drug production, like 40, 50, $50,000. So talk to me a little bit about how the, what, what is the setup and, and how is it unique? Yeah. So the first thing that makes us unique is our, you could say it's not our target audience, but early career scientists is who we are vetting, if you will. So there's a gap in the, pipeline of research and I'm sure CC can speak to this a lot more <laughs> but just from the, the individuals that we are funding and supporting the 50 to 50,000 40,000 a lot of them it's to develop that you know proof of principle we call it seed money um, so that then again it's not a lot of organizations are giving million dollar grants like you're saying huge 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 grants but we really believe that breakthrough is going to come from this level it's this it's this really exciting time the innovation just to, to meet with these early career scientists and it's not age early career does not mean age or young it's just you know in the beginning of their career maybe less established newer in a lab um just finished some schooling along those lines right. so it's investing in this new generation of scientists and it's really cool to get to be um i don't know sitting sitting front seats or front line or whatever sport analogy you'd like to use um to really get to watch them come up with these out of the box ideas and then we get to say we're so excited we're going to support you uh, we obviously fund and i'll let cc speak to this as well because he's on the internal internal review team we have a lot of acronyms irt drc all the you know every nonprofit. but it will he can talk a little bit more about how we go through that process um, but that's the the target group if you will that we fund so i'll talk later about how we fund them through crowdfunding but cc i, I welcome you to talk about the process sure so we set this up for in, in kind of a way based on how we thought funding agencies didn't work efficiently. All of us on the scientific review committee, both internal and external, know the pains and struggles of trying to get a grant from the government. And that is you go in, you submit the grant, you have to wait six or eight months for it to get reviewed. Then after review, you normally have to go through and do a revision. And then after that, you wind up finding out sometime nine to 12 months later, whether the money is there. Then your budget is often cut. And more importantly, the funding line for most research now is 10 to 15%. So 10 to 15% of the ideas that come through get funded. And I think fundamentally, when we started, we didn't believe that only 10 to 15% of PhD and MD ideas were fundable. We think that it's a much higher number. And so what we decided to do was make that process as optimal and transparent as possible. And so I think that one of the themes that you'll see from uh, this discussion today is uh, transparency and um, rigor in scientific review. I think those two themes will wind up kind of permeating through a lot of this discussion. And what we decided to do was, we know that there are a lot of people involved in type one diabetes, and not all of them are immunologists, not of them, all of them are regenerative medicine people, not all of them deal with, you know, extracellular matrix. There's tons of different specialties, but if you get them all together and you send them one page from somebody who's a scientist in the field, they should be able to read it and say, hmm, is this a good idea or a bad idea? And so the first step is the applicant will come through, submit one page. Here's what I want to do. And the review board will go yes or no. And it's 50% plus one. And, you know, We've got 80 different people from all the top universities across the country, as well as some now in Canada and moving into Europe, who review this. Wow. And as long as they say yes, then what we do is we ask them, so that takes about two to three weeks. 
We then ask them to come back and submit three pages. Now, if you've ever written a real NIH grant, I've, I've submitted an NIH grant as part of what's called a program project grant. And the grant was 1,250 pages yeah. total. This is three pages. And we ask them to do it. And then we, then we send it to three people on this same board who are experts in it. They take two weeks, look at it and say yes or no. And if it's yes, then it's considered vetted. Now, any one of them can kill this with a good, with a good rational reason to kill it at any point. So if somebody says that's not going to work because of that, then we consider it killed. So there's rigor involved yeah. and there's transparency. They get the comments. They know what's going on. They don't know who it's from, but they know what, what's there. And then if that happens, then we say, all right, you're set then for the board and you're, you're set then to go up on the grant. And so then we begin the process of putting it up on the website and asking for money. Now, this goes to one final point that I want to make that makes DRC so different from any other organization that I know of. And that is you actually see where your money goes. If you give your money to, you know, I don't want to mention any other ones, but say to breast cancer research and you give them a hundred dollars, you have no idea where that hundred dollars winds up. Yeah. If you give, you can go on the website and select any of these projects and feel confident that they've been vetted scientifically. And if they match with what you're doing, we have four areas, cure, complications, preventions, and prevention and care. And so if you're interested in somebody who's got, say, diabetic neuropathies and you want to talk about care, if there's a grant up there for it, you can put your money to it. You will know where it is. And then most importantly, at six months and a year after, once the grant is completed, you find out what happens. I mean, it's a novel concept. It is. It's amazing, actually. Yeah. It's a novel concept in how a 501c3 should operate. All right. I'll let you go back to Casey and have it, more it, about it, what it, the process is. Yeah. It's funny because while you were describing that, I'm, I'm smiling because my wife is a physician mm -hmm. and she, she's, she does a ton of research. And yeah, watching the NIH application process is crazy. It's so the, it, it's, you know, and I hate to say it, but it's almost like government, get out of the way. Let us, let us people, we can handle this. Um, all right, Casey. So at, looking on the website, you know, you see four or five people that they're 26,000 up to their $50,000 goal. Do you guys, is it set up where you say each year we're, we want to raise a million bucks? So, so uh, donors commit early or is it more just like donors can go online and see and, and kind of donate during throughout the year how, how do, what is the process like yeah you anybody can donate anytime <laughs> so okay. I'll just throw that out there yeah I'm all, we're always accepting donations um no but so i'll explain a little bit so crowdfunding right it's this online mechanism for fundraising and you've probably seen peer-to-peer -peer types of fundraising you've seen a gofundme page right let's all raise money for so and so they they need help um or you see sometimes there's like over a walk you know you support me as I do this walk. It's these crowdfunding techniques where you can kind of choose maybe what event or what person or, or what thing. So really DRC is unique again. Now we are the, well, the only disease specific um, nonprofit. We started doing crowdfunding, right? So we, there's many others now and we've actually helped nonprofits implement it. So originally it was, the thought was kind of like a Kickstarter. We'll show these photos. They'll have their names and you know, their titles and people will go in and see and want to invest. Great concept. We needed to take it one step further and bring it to the community and translate um, what these scientists are doing so that the public, right, lay people, me, I will say me, I don't know scientific jargon at all. I need somebody to say, here's what I'm doing. I'm yeah. developing this technology and this is what it will do for this person's life and it will improve it in this way. I mean, that simple. Um, while I love CC's brain <laughs> and all of our IRT members, all of our board members, you know, they also think and talk like scientists and researchers at times, those who serve in that field in that capacity. So we are different and unique in that we love, because 1%, less than 1% of funding, right, goes to those 36 and younger in this field. So that's really, really small amount. So we started to realize that 
these individuals having their direct access is kind of what I like to call it. And again, that's what makes us unique is there's a photo of this researcher showing how much that they've currently raised. Now, DRC's pledged, we have pledged to raise the full amount of whatever grant we give. So if we have a research gift agreement with an individual, a, a early career scientist, and through their institution, then we say we're giving you 50, 40, 75, whatever is approved based on what the, you know, their project proposal is. We then say, okay, we will we'll cover that. That's all coming out of our funds. So sometimes people will say, you know, 50% of our general funds go towards research. Like we're, we're, it's not just all operational costs at all. So, cause we really believe in our mission and we, we wanna support research. So we have these individual photos and bios. You can see a video. Um, I love Dr. Bader, B-O-E-D-E-R. He's one of our new scientists and his video is so fun. Um, and if you watch it, you'll be like, oh, I think I understand what he's talking about, which is even more exciting. Um, but that's a great example if you wanna check it out. Really, it's us showcasing, here's who we are funding live. So you can go on, click the button. Wow, I really like what Dr. Bader's saying. This makes sense, I'm really interested. He's at UCSD. I went there, my friend went there. Whatever your connection is, and you click donate and we guarantee hundred percent of your funds are going to go towards this project. So we're kind of saying to these researchers, Hey, you know, we're already going to give you the money, but then we're raising the money from the community directly for that project. So that's kind of the intricacies of how it works. The, the main difference, again, the direct access always allowing donors to choose what project they're actually excited about or they understand or what interests them. They are going to have also communication with that researcher. So, I've had many researchers get on the phone and talk to donors and have conversations. They do Zoom calls with us or they do Q and A's or obviously based on their availability. <laughs> They're very busy people, um, but they write handwritten cards, thank you letters. And they also, because we really value transparency, they provide project updates frequently. And that's again, part of their agreement with us that they will provide six month and one year updates that our community can understand. So again, it's, when we say we're a connection, right? Diabetes research connection, where we are all connecting together. We need the community to work together towards a solution to diabetes. You know, I love, it's the researchers and it's the community and those affected with and impacted by type one working together. And so, yeah, does that answer your question about uh, absolutely. what it's and, like? And, and to, further, to further clarify, so it sounds like you, a scientist gets approved, he gets approved for 50 grand. You say, regardless of what we can what what gets raised or not within a certain period of time if at the end of that certain period of time you've only raised 10 we'll cover the other 40. and so so you, you're basically saying at the end of this point we'll cover you if nobody else steps in yep how often do do people do do, do those funds get oversold by people like i mean the donations is it is it pretty quick is it is it are you successful at having the outside people raising the money for these for these scientists? What, what's kind of like the, I guess, what would be the, the, the percentage of, do you know? Yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. I know what you're saying. Well, so it's, you know, it's kind of all over the place. So it just depends on what projects really speak to the community at that time. Um, we just had a, an individual donor. I won't, I won't mention names. I know they meant they like to be anonymous fund two two projects at 50,000 a piece, you know, so um, saw their photo, liked them immediately and fully funded them on the spot they we still have a year with them to get their updates and everything but yeah. they're fully funded and when i say it goes 100 percent, you know if you go on and you click dr bader and it's going to his lab it's also to protect from the institutional overhead right because i think and i think that's the point cc was getting at at times you donate to something and you're like how much of my money yeah. is really going towards this mission i personally don't like differentiating i think Operational costs are necessary to move a nonprofit forward. But at the same time, if you really want to see how your, your money, your donation is impacting one project, then donate it to that project. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about it getting sucked up in all these other costs because we really want to make that clear. I mean, we do have a handful of donors that are committed to covering our overhead. I shouldn't say committed, <laughs> who, who have in the past committed and every year it's a, it's a new game, but we have faithful donors and, and supporters, but it is definitely kind of hit or miss when it's fully funded, but we keep them on there because if you also think of it this way, 
if DRC is, is paying stipends, I don't want to say stipends, but they're paying according to a, a gift agreement. And we say, here's 20,000, but then 20,000 comes in for that project, right? Then it's kind of like this, this, and I don't want to say like loaning, we're not loaning the money because we want to support the research and that's out of our general funds. But it just depends on, on the timing of it, I'd say for what the percentage is. For the most part, it's, it's pretty high. Um, at the same time, in our 2018 dance, we actually just did anything, you know, we had sponsors that covered the event costs 100%. So every dollar raised that night went to DRC and we said general funds. And we said to everybody, the general funds, we use our general funds for these research projects. But if you want to choose a specific research project, we will restrict that money for that. And everybody said, no, put it to the general fund and support as much research as you can. So it is known in our community that we really do, again, we value transparency. We really yeah. do use our funds towards our mission to support research. Yeah. And, and, and again, uh, any of those donations are, are tax deductible, right? So whatever, some, whatever an individual donates, it's all set up tax deductible. Uh, yes. And that, that's what I think is just amazing about this. And again, it's diabetesresearchconnection.org to go online and you can see all the, uh, all the current research projects that are, that are looking for funds and are funded. And it's, uh, it, it'll answer all the questions that you, that you might have. So CC, this is 2012. This sort of thing was way ahead of its time. How did you guys come up with this? Um, so it came up. So I had independently been working on a much larger idea of, um, how the government could fund and recoup money for all sorts of scientific research. And, you know, I had worked a long time very closely with Alberto Hayek, who was one of the founders, and as well, um, David Winkler, who was on the board of the UCSD Pediatric Diabetes Center. And I was talking to Alberto one night at dinner and he said, you know, that's pretty funny that you mentioned that because David and I have been looking at this Kickstarter model for um, trying to raise money for scientists. And so we kind of pooled our ideas together and I very quickly gave up on the idea of having the government involved. And we realized at that point um, because I had, you know, although I'd been out of my PhD at that point for maybe 15 years, I was still kind of in an early phase because I'd finished two postdocs and was interested in getting funding. And I had just received my first large grant and said, you know, it would be great to be able to have people who have these ideas get funded. And so we kind of talked around and came upon this idea and concept that really the target should be these people who are at this critical stage in their research and trying to become independent and have these great ideas. And we went back in history and thought about it. And you know, Einstein, when he came up with his theory of relativity was in his twenties. Banting and Best, when they discovered insulin, were in their early twenties. There's a huge amount of scientific history that suggests that early career scientists with out of the box ideas tend to make giant impacts. And I don't mean this as a slight to all of my friends in the diabetes research community, but there is a very large portion of people who are doing type one research that have been doing this type of research for many years. And they tend to get the lion's share of the money and their ideas while quite good often don't provide enough fertile ground for new projects and new ideas to grow. So this is how we kind of thought and began to form DRC was on these ideas that people should, people who are in the research community should have grounds to have their ideas go, grow. The other side of it that was, that's critically important to me, and I think as important as anything that Casey has really touched upon quite nicely, is I'm also very interested in involving the community and having them learn and understand. Because as we can talk about on many different topics, having a base scientific education 
and understanding how difficult and convoluted and frustrating science is really helps the public gain trust in what we're doing, the transparency behind all of this. So this has been one of the kind of side goals and benefits of what we do. One of the things that's not heralded enough, I think, is that the Diabetes Research Connection has um, keeps up with current news in what's happening in the type one world. So we're a source for credible information that we then push out and try to ensure that people have the most accurate and up-to-date knowledge without any of the sort of media hype that is, that is the standard, We've, we're close to a cure to yeah. 10 years out now. You don't want to provide false hope, but you want to provide how something realistically fits in the context of what's trying to happen. Well, and, and with that being said, it, I mean, it, you almost get the sense that the government and big farm and all these treat most people just like their children. I would rather, I'd rather Dr. Bader, let's just use him as an example. I'd rather invest in, in him and then have those periodic updates and actually understand the challenges that he's going through, maybe some of the setbacks. And because it then, then the scientist actually becomes human. He's not some crazy, uh, you know, that doesn't comb his hair and sits in the back of a lab all day long. That, that's right. That I just threw that out there for Gene Wilder from Young Frankenstein. But, um, well, you didn't uh, see but, CC's you, before his haircut. He had a, he had some a long, long haircut. Long haircut. <laughs> I, I've seen I've seen those I've seen those hairdos. But uh, I resemble that quite yeah. often. <laughs> but I mean, so so I I actually I think that would and like you said, it breaks it brings it down to the to the common man this is what science is. It's not pretty. It's sometimes it's a, it's a battle. So you're slugging through. And I think I appreciate that. All right. Yeah, so I would add to just during this, the last year and a half, two years where there's been a lot of misinformation out there, we have, we have also seen that the type one diabetes diabetic community had needed more resources and more support. And, you know, when it was the lockdown first happened, we were getting phone calls, I'm in lockdown, but I don't have insulin. Can you help me? And we were just connecting anybody yeah. in our community any way we could to help support them through a difficult time. So providing information, we got questions, a lot of questions about, is this safe? You know, the vaccine type one, and should I do this or that? And, you know, being able to share, like CC saying, credible <laughs> resources and, and news that is really needed in difficult times. And for this community who is more at risk, a lot of them have, pre-existing conditions, overlapping conditions as a result of their diabetes. Um, they're, you know, the most vulnerable in the population, if you want to say that. And, and we really felt like it was not only our duty to protect, but educate and be responsive and to continue to send out any information that we found. So we even collaborated with a couple of local organizations that were doing kind of COVID task forces. And they, it was Beyond Type 1 is a, a, a type 1 diabetes nonprofit that was sending out resources and we kind of worked with them. But again, like Cece was saying, it's, it's our internal team that's fetting these different stories and that we were sending out regularly. And it was really needed in that time and, and still is. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I think that goes to one other thing, just to follow up briefly. Absolutely. That our organization has found a niche that we belong in. And we are incredibly collaborative because we believe that what we do is we fund the people who then go to larger organizations such as JDRF, such as the NIH, such as American Diabetes Association. And they say, here's this, what we've done with this, now provide us with more money. And so it's kind of a nice way to, we see ourselves at the beginning of this process and the genesis of it. So there's no competition. We all work together and we all split information and other things of that nature to really try to help the patient. That's the end goal. Yeah. And uh, again, it's, it's, if you're interested in learning more about it, it's the diabetes research connection.org is the website. And uh, if you like what we're doing over here at Rain Man's Take, go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe. So um, in terms of the structure CC, so you, I assume in, in, the, uh, in the board, you have some kind of a map that says, this is where we want to get to. This is where we are right now. These are the, our previous, 
our previous researchers did X, Y, Z, and now we're going to start building on it. Is that kind of how you guys, is that how you mapping it out or? It is. And in fact, um, Casey can address this because uh, they just sent out a social media post on uh, Instagram that showed the return on investment for if you invested $1 what that's returned in these researchers, all of the researchers that we've previously funded's ability to get money. And I believe it's $38 for every dollar you've donated. Is that correct? So the return on investment has been ridiculously high. We've had two or three people at this point that have directly used our funding to be able to get over a million dollar grants. And yeah, we, we had six. As, as so in the beginning of 2020, we created our first impact report, if you want to call it that. You know, again, we're almost 10 years old in 2022. So please come to our next event. If <laughs> it will be in person, I'm just going to no, I know I have no clue what's going to happen. But next summer, um, we were going to celebrate our 10 year anniversary and do our dance for diabetes. And we're so excited to do it in person, please. Um, but I think we did this impact report because we are small and so we don't necessarily do an annual report, right? Um, we, we've been just seeing as much, how can we find as much research as possible? That was really it. And then what we started to see was, it was actually six as of 2020 had secured a, a total of $8.6 million in follow-on funding from their discoveries and proof of principle from their DRC supported projects. So that's another thing is that I had a conversation, I remember, with a couple of our, our scientists, and the, we said, thank you, you know, here's your funding, stay in touch, and, and then I got contacted by another organization saying, hey, we're looking to support, you know, the most innovative science, do you have anyone? And I said, for how much? And they said, this much, and I immediately called these two scientists and said, hey, apply to them, and, you know, say you came from us, because we want to see them succeed, um, yeah. and if we can help start that kickstart that's you know really support them and, and launch them into these discoveries we don't have millions of dollars <laughs> to be able to invest but we do have 50 grand and we can continue to support at that level and then watch them like cc said not only secure follow-on funding but at the beginning of 2023 to four of our scientists had also established their own labs many are teaching um at, at institutions which is great we love that and we've had three I think actually now we have five, but in the beginning of 2023, we're published. Um, so, so again, research is slow moving, which sometimes isn't the, the sexiest part about it to, to those who are wanting to fund research. It can take a while. But when we think of this and we think of the, the need, um, I just read something that by 2050, there's an expected 5 million, that potentially 5 million Americans could have type 1 diabetes. I mean, that's so much more than what we're seeing 1.6 million. So the need and then getting to see that proof of principles are established, but also we're seeing success in all these other ways is really exciting for our community and for us to continue to move forward and, and see more happen. And, and uh, obviously it sounds like the, 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 and so this is the, this is the, uh, this is the, the seed time where they, where they, proof of concept, they prove it. Now they're ready to go either get hired by some of the big companies that are doing the research, or like you said, start their own uh, labs. And, and, and without sounding callous or, or, or saying that it's all about the money, I'm just, I'm just curious, is that like those people that start the lab, do they then do that do, are, from your pool of people that have donated? Are there people that see those investments? Like, and so now it turns from a nonprofit situation to a for-profit type of venture capital money is that does that work in this regard or not really so i well, i have seen i can speak to one of our, our biggest or largest donors if you will and um, they've given over the years um, they just really really connected with one of our researchers and saw his project um take off and then he moved and started a lab and they said can we go with him like we want to still support you, but we also really believe in what he's doing. And we said, of course, please go support him. Um, we, you know, it doesn't have to go through DRC if you're, if you're investing in any of our scientists. So I don't really know the ins and outs of what they did. Cause again, that's their own investments and, and their own, their own money. <laughs> um, but we have seen that happen um, on a rare occasion. And I think overall, we would love to continue to have our supporters go on and continue to support the scientists they connect with or that they really believe in. Yeah. And, and, uh, and CC, how over the last 10 years, how is, how's the progress been? So 
Let me, let me, if you don't mind, before I go to the progress thing, let me kind of follow up a little bit on what Casey was saying and how that happens. Because, you know, once, so people who decide then to move and support the scientist, um, it tends to then go not directly to the scientist. So you were asking about a for-profit venture capital type thing. Um, what it tends to go to is to the university. And so when you get kind of bogged down in that, um, it gets a little bit convoluted if you want to directly give to somebody through a university. Um, if any of these people then went out on their own and started their own company and took these people as VC, then that's a completely different story. We've yet to have that happen, but lot, most of them have stayed in the university setting. And that just turns into a gift agreement under normal circumstances. So to the question of how progress has been, and, you know, it's, there was, let me back up to about 15 years ago when there was, and I think this will probably um, answer the question and highlight problems and hope. About 15 years ago, there was a giant amount of hope around using um, cell replacement therapy, uh, differentiating human stem cells into insulin producing cells, having them be able to sense glucose, and then be able to transplant those um, to then have patients effectively cured. Um, they, you know, everybody was certain that this was the answer. And it was, as many people will say, just, you know, the fad of the day. And it's not really a fad. It was a true and good um, therapeutic, a therapeutic biochemically validated approach. But the problem is that there were complications. And one of the complications is you can have, for instance, say you started out with a million cells and you were able to differentiate all but one of them into insulin producing cells, but one of them didn't get the message. That one cell had the ability to not only grow faster than the other cells, but also could grow into anything. And so what you wound up getting were these tumors called teratomas, which have all three germ layers in them. And obviously the FDA is never going to approve, approve of that. So the next approach became um, well, we need to keep them separate. So we'll use encapsulation devices. And there's been some remarkable successes with it, but generally speaking, there needs to be more engineering behind it. So what's happened is the same thing as anything else. We have come up, we have spent our time doing diligent and good science and good research. But what we've come up with is each time we come up, come, overcome a hurdle, there's another one there. And what we're seeing now is much more refined research on this. You're seeing, looking at um, something called beta cell senescence, where the cell just kind of stops functioning and how that might be a cue to other beta cells. You're seeing a large impact, especially because of the work that's been done with cancer and immuno, uh, uh, immune cells seeing the, uh, how the immune, the immune system interacts with the beta cell in the pancreas. So you're starting to see these kind of very important sorts of studies that are really fundamental for what the technology and knowledge is. And with that, you're getting closer and closer. As well, there's a whole other side of this, which is the... Um, the uh, ability to continuously monitor glucose, the ability of having insulin and glucagon in the artificial pancreas come online. So the technology is driving this, but the science is still working on it. And I don't want to ever give anybody false hope by saying a cure is X number of years away. But I do believe that within this generation who's developing it now, that they will be the last generation that will have to go through and suffer like most type ones have to this point. Wow, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's amazing. It's, um, I didn't, you know, it's, it's kind of like that, uh, it, it almost seems like you're just mop more uh, pushing away the puddle on the, on the pool deck, but slowly, incrementally, you're, 
you're getting there. And then it sounds like as that's coming, now you're starting to get those advances that you see on television where, you know, they have the, those monitors that you can put on your arm. So it, it definitely seems like it's moving obviously in, in the right direction. Um, what are your, what are your socials, Casey? What are, where, where can people find you out there? Instagram, Facebook, yeah. all those yeah, things. Yeah, we're in everything. <laughs> okay. um, Instagram, Facebook, and all of that would just be Diabetes Research Connection. Um, actually, we're not on TikTok. Sorry, I'm, I have no clue how to work that <laughs> quite yet. Um, I'm trying to see. Yeah, we're Diabetes Research Connection on Instagram. We have Twitter as well. I'd have to look up the name for that too, but okay. all of the links are at the bottom of our website as well. You can click on and- them. What, uh, how big is your community of donor donors and just the, the community in general? How big is it? Well, so our online following is about 30,000. Um, and a lot of that does include website visits. Actually, that number is an older number too. We're realizing that in the last two years, <laughs> that has increased. Yeah. Um, and we're still gathering that data. Our donors in the beginning of 2020, I think we were at about 775 donors. Um, not annually, that's in a life in our lifetime. And now our records, because again, we try to include anybody in the community that we connect with, because we do believe that people can give, you can give not only financially, um, you can come to an event, volunteer at an event, bring friends to an event. Really, we need those who are going to give their time, energy, resources, talents, right. you know, it's, it's not always directly cash. We, we love it. And we, if you can donate your car, you can donate land, I mean, whatever you'd like. But we really are seeing that people are wanting to get involved in different ways. So now we have, gosh, thousands and thousands of of individuals in our our database, which is so exciting, but they're not all supporters. But many of them are advocates for us or they're connected in other ways. And we do have a big volunteer pool. We haven't had a ton of (laughs) in-person opportunities to use these volunteers, but we love getting to work with individuals on events. Um, We typically do two on, I would say, in, in different times, um, two to three in-person events a year, our dance, we do a meet the researchers event where we actually fly researchers out and you can meet them and talk to them. Um, and then we have other small happy hours here and there where we just want to connect to our community. Hopefully, locally, we have things that are going on potentially this year. Um, most of them are t- turning virtual. So some wine tasting and different things like that to support local businesses. And we do have a national following. So you know, it's funny, as much as we might not love Zoom, um, it has become huge and in our outreach to donors and supporters in, in different states. So, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so, Cece, when you first started, how were you getting the word out there? Or was it just kind of whoever you knew that, that had type 1? or We were pretty lucky that we um, immediately amassed a following of really great type one community leaders. And again, this goes to the the fact that everybody sees a need for what we were doing. And so we had people that had been at organizations like JDRF, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, people who've been involved with UCSD, people who come from the American Diabetes Association, all came and sat and basically started asking us what they could do. This was a new thing and they wanted to be involved. So it was really very easy. And we have one of our, you know, well, two of our board members who were the founders, Alberto and David. And Alberto knows everybody in science. And if you've ever met Alberto, he is one of the most gregarious, smart, and charming people you'll ever meet. He is a clinician who helped, who's helped countless number of people and done a ton for the community. So his name associated with this as a founder really helped draw people in. And on the other side is David Winkler, who's a community activist and has really been one of the people who has come along and coalesced the lay people's side of this entire organization. And just real quick to follow up on one of the things that Casey was talking about, about lay people becoming involved with us. One of the other things that we do that we kind of failed to mention in all of this is we have a lay review committee. And that is once a grant's approved, it then goes to the lay people on the committee that read it and say, I don't understand a damn word of what this says. 
and they work to try to make it translatable. And that's a pretty cool thing. And it's really one of the things that makes, I think, translating the science. You can take really complicated words and acronyms, because that's what science is, and boil them down to concepts. And this lay review committee has been fantastic. And I'm not just saying that because my own is on it. <laughs> there are some really great people and good friends of the yeah. community. And uh, how long has, it, has that been around? Because that seems like it's a really novel idea. Since the beginning. Really? It's been one of the first things that we baked in. Well, but we weren't unique in doing this. JDRF had one. And for numerous reasons, many years ago, they got rid of it. And it was really one of the things that a lot of the people who come from JDRF to engage with us had said that they really enjoy because it's, it gave them this connection and purpose. And it made, you know, one of the things that people want to do when someone that they love is afflicted is they want to do something to help anything. And this was a way for them to do it. And it gave them something tangible that said, I'm involved with helping push this forward. Yeah. And I think that that's a very powerful driver for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in the, in the whole nonprofit realm where, where donations are, you know, like you said earlier, yeah. you sometimes you have no idea where, where that's going. And then you, then you find out that the president of the nonprofit flies around in a G5, wherever he goes. Um, and, and so are there other, uh, I guess diseases out there that there are other groups like you that are doing this sort of thing, or is this because I, 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 like I said, I've never heard of this and it's fascinating. Casey, you want to take this on? <laughs> I want to say no. <laughs> We're the only yeah. ones ever yeah. doing this. <laughs> um, I mean, as far as, as far as using some of our, our model, like I said, I know that our, previous executive director was working with the, I believe the American brain foundation. Um, and she was helping them create some crowdfunding platforms. And, and again, we were the first disease specific to do crowdfunding and some of the types of, of online fundraising that we've launched. Um, and again, it, it wasn't as successful until we started to have a development team who could also build relationships um, with individuals in the community as well. You can't just put something out on the internet and hope, it raises right. enough money to support research, right? You, you need to have some individuals driving traffic or things that are actually leading you to that. Um, and we really are focused on the community. So I know that other disease specific nonprofits are doing great things. And I'm not going to say <laughs> we're the only one, but in, the, in a lot of ways, we're very unique in our approach. Got it. Got it. And I, go ahead. I actually saw this as um, I really had a much larger vision because I thought, it was going to be a hell of a lot easier than it turned out to be of just having research connection and having various hubs in this where you would have you know people who were interested in you know whatever it may be breast cancer and have that happen but you know this is we realized very quickly in this that we needed to stay focused and that this was actually a much larger issue than we could handle even with just ourselves so it would have gotten too complicated but we're happy to export the model anywhere gotcha and are there uh so is the type one diabetes uh disease if i can if i can call it that and if i if that's wrong i apologize mm -hmm. but is that is that big enough where there could be other organizations like you in various other aspects of that research, or you guys are covering just the type one. We're covering just type Got one. Got it. Yeah. But, and you know, it's, we'd like to be able to get further penetrance into the community. I think that there are some sort of stats that suggest that a very small number under 20%, of the people are really aware and understand the resources that are out there for help. And it's not just people like us wanting research money, but people who um, help with maintenance of controlling your blood sugars and other things like that. There's a ton of great resources. And I think that most of the 1.6 million people out there underutilize them. And part of what we want to do is make sure that all of the resources are there because it's in our best interest to help promote 
healthy, safe living for those with type one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we are solely focused on type one, which does make us different. There are many organizations who expand. They, they, it's type two and type one. And, you know, I'm glad that there's other organizations, you know, looking for solutions to any, any other disease. But at the same time, what we found, our, our co-founders are, we have a type one diabetic. That's a co-founder. We have an endocrinologist who his whole career was working with, with type ones. And so there is a special focus on that. And I really do think it helps us stay committed to that area and not stray. We've seen other type one organizations expand even beyond diabetes altogether. And it can just water down the mission. And we've also found that the type one community really wants a cure and they really want solutions and they really want to see advancements in, you know, their, their care and treatment. So we're happy to be dedicated to only type one diabetes research. Yeah. And, and the type one community is unlike a lot of other communities. They are in, I mean, I learn things from plenty of lay people who keep up with other aspects of it. I've been getting onto airplanes, reading a scientific paper, and somebody say, hey, look, do you do type 1 research? And I say, yes. And they will talk to me about something that I have no idea, a continuous glucose monitor, whatever. They are an informed group. So it's an awesome group to start with. All right. And just out of curiosity, do you guys, do you guys uh, connect with the physicians that are working with uh, type 1 patients? To, so that so that they know that that's a resource that they can be handed out to for for information that sort of thing seems like that would be a yeah I think the main way that we have been working with physicians because I think there's a lot of it, there, there are a lot of different types of research for type one and, and diabetes research within local hospitals, right? So they're potentially going to push the agenda of whatever hospital they're working for, or, you know, that that's typically how it goes. But what we've really been utilizing are different endocrinologists or those who work with type one diabetes patients to come speak um, at some of our virtual gatherings or to do a Q and A or, you know, during November, which is national diabetes awareness month, we're going to do a live Q and A with a, a couple of different physicians from, from local hospitals where they can just answer questions. So I think the, the main way that we're connecting is through education and awareness, um, because obviously we had one board member diagnose herself during an awareness campaign. When she was in her teens in New York, she saw a sign that said, are you experiencing this, 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 this? And she said, yes, 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 yes. And she called her doctor, said, I think I have type one. And she did. So we definitely love the awareness building piece and the education and local and you can add to the CC, but local physicians and, and doctors really help assist us in that way and get the word out to their communities. Couldn't have said it better, Casey. Now, getting back to the, uh, to the scientists that, that, uh, that you identify that are, that are doing this research, where are they in their careers? Are they, is this like they're, they're still finishing up their, their doctorates and they have not yet gone to, a, to where their career will start? Is that where, where you're getting them? So they, there is, um, after one receives a PhD, normally there's a time period um, of additional training called postdoctoral fellowships. And um, this is where you spend two to three to 10 years in various labs of people who are doing the work that you want to continue and do on your own. And so you're getting kind of advanced and specialized training. So, for instance, with me, um, my PhD was dealing with um, white blood cells and um, a protein in it called myeloperoxidase um, that basically is involved in wound healing. And I decided I wanted to switch and look at another aspect of white blood cell biochemistry. And so I spent two to five years in various labs training on looking at something called protein kinases. And they're part of the white blood cell, they're just a different part. And this is kind of advanced specialized training. And then I took that and I used it and I've used, and basically I've become a protein kinase expert that studies type one diabetes. I've applied it to how stem cells understand to become a beta cell. So it's this specialized training period. 
And it's right then and there that you're coming up with these ideas because often you're coming from a field that is not within this specific area. And you say, oh, I could take this piece and this piece and bring them together and make something brand new. And a lot of times both sides won't see what you see because you are the expert. And that's what these postdoctoral fellows are. And once you get this and move on to your first academic position, you're still taking these ideas that you've synthesized and saying, hey, look at me, listen to me. This is good stuff. Let's try to drive this. So this is where this group, this group of people that we try to target really are. And as, uh, how helpful is uh, somebody who's gone through this program with DRC getting jobs and then getting their, their ability to get more money? Is this a, is this a pretty, pretty good feather to have in your cap? You know, it's starting to be. We're young enough where we are very careful with the scientists that we choose. And we've been very fortunate that we have had some outstanding scientists who have kind of led the way, made some really good early decisions. And so a lot of them have moved on to start their own lab. A lot of them have gotten subsequent funding. A lot of them have had high profile, high impact papers in the type one field. So it's starting to be recognized that this is what we're doing. We're further expanding our reach next month by um, sponsoring and co-sponsoring and co-sponsoring an event uh, with the Western Regional Islet Study Group where we offer an award for the best talk. We um, are going to potentially fund one of the projects that's deemed the best out of there. So we're trying to shoot for having quality over quantity at this point and it hasn't been a problem because like i said at the beginning you know you're looking at a 15 percent funding rate i think that somewhere between you know 30 to 50 percent of all ideas that come through probably have some have strong merit and should be considered for funding i don't know that we'll get to that point but i certainly would like to think that we could yeah. And where, where are you? Where are you in that in that uh, that trajectory? So you have X number of scientists present of that single paper. And then out of those, how many do you pick? What, what is it generally um, speaking? So, so of the um, LOIs, we've we've had a really good. Well, we've started out small and we have been very targeted in um, how we are advertising. And so traditionally we've funded somewhere between about 60 to 80% of all grants that come through. We recently just closed our last um, RFA, which is request for applications, and we had a record number. We had 23 different um, applications come through. So what we're gonna shoot to try to do is probably fund somewhere in the neighborhood of half. Um, we're gonna see how that works with budgets. It's a damn nice problem to have. Yeah. more good science than one could possibly want. And so that unfortunately puts more pressure on Casey and the staff to um, really make the um, urgency and criticalness of the mission uh, known. Casey, you want to add to that? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Wholeheartedly. <laughs> I love it. Again, this is... Uh, C.C. King and Casey Davis with the uh, Diabetes Research Connection, and that's www.diabetesresearchconnection.org if you're interested in, uh, in donating to any of the uh, current projects that they have, and you'll find all that information up on their, uh, up on their website. So um, you got a dance, you got happy hours, you've got several other things. Next up is the, uh, is the, the dance the annual gala, and that's going to be when? Yeah, so, well, we do have, like I said, some virtual things or events for the rest of this year. Um, we're going to be doing a toast. So November, there'll be a lot of different ways for people to kind of e-meet us or virtually meet us. We'll do a, a toast to our organizational film. We're going to debut it. We'll be doing potentially a virtual wine tasting. It's going to be in person as of now with Caruth Winery in Solana Beach, uh, but we most likely will go to virtual. Um, and those are this year just little things we're doing hopefully we do the dance 2022 in september so we normally do it in september and it's in del mar um but 
we will see what happens. And we're also planning for 2022 to have quite a few in-person events as well. Just so stay connected and then you'll be able to see what we're doing. <laughs> now, one, one kind of one final thing here. And uh, I guess because I'm curious because my impression is when people start to do research, they get really close to the vest and they want to kind of keep what they're, what they're researching kind of to themselves. Now, obviously you guys start them out. It's very transparent. They're very transparent with their, their fund or their donors, but then they go to a, uh, go to a university or start their own lab. Um, how rare is it to be that transparent in, in the research? Is, it seems to me that that's probably gotta be super rare. Well, we definitely protect, I mean, I should say we protect our researchers as well. So part of the agreements is, you know, what intellectual property or specific things. So at times we have, you know, they'll have a, a, a six month update or a year update coming up and they say, you know what, we're not ready to share this yet. Um, you know, this part of our project because we're going to get published and here's why or whatever. We're going on for additional funding in this area. So we really work with our, our scientists in that regard where we're, sharing enough so that people can see donors, supporters, our community can have access to what's going on. But then if, like you said, there's different things that we, they aren't ready to go with publicly, we don't make them. And to follow up on that as well, it's, it's kind of one thing to say, you know, I'm looking at SMAD2 signaling in the regulation of beta cell proliferation. It's quite another to say, that you've been using CRISPR to modify SMAD2 at a certain amino acid position to be able to facilitate a different interaction that drives transcription of specific genes. That, you know, there's a huge difference in those two, even though it might not particularly sound like it, you know, you can be general. <laughs> we, and now you see why we have labor review committees. <laughs> I'm just yeah. gonna throw that out there. I, I was like, <laughs> but. You, you get the point. One yeah. is saying we're doing one thing and the other yeah. one is giving the detailed road. Right. right. You know, it, it's very much of a, hey, I live in North, North County versus, hey, this is my address. Yeah. So what it's it, and most people in science, especially academics, are excited to talk about their work. They want to collaborate. They want to have recognition because really it's a lot of times a thankless job and science is really 90 to 95 percent just beating your head up against a wall it's constant failure and you know that five to ten percent where you can actually see the aha moment even if it's a tiny aha moment is one of the most rewarding things and you want to go scream it from the mountaintop now, uh, so, so like you were talking about earlier, you, you, you get these people out there to say the, the, the cure is just around the corner. We're almost there. Who is, who is pushing those scientists to say that? Is that the people that have the money, i.e. the university? Are they pushing them to, to get that out? Or how does that, how does that happen where they go from, you know, where they're talking to, again, I, I completely understand that's a, I, I think nobody likes to report, you know, you can't make news with incremental achievement made, you know, yeah. it has to be, that just isn't exciting. I, and unfortunately, that's what it really is. And so there's probably a hundred different people along the pipeline that, that make this. And, you know, if you go back and look at the primary literature on it, there's no such statements of that, or rarely are there any sorts of bold statements. There are statements of this is what we've done. And then person A, it's the telephone game. And, you know, you can't, you can't blame people or judge them for being excited. What you can do is try to educate them on how this fits in to the larger picture, how the brick fits into the wall. And it's damaging, right? It's damaging to over promise and under deliver for 1.6 million Americans who are suffering or struggling through this with this autoimmune disease with no known cure to say there'll be a cure, there'll be a cure. Um, and so I think we have seen other nonprofits say things and promise cures and I, it could be to raise funds. It could be out of eagerness 
hearts and excitement. I'm not sure, but I've had a lot of conversations with many supporters in our community who say, have said, somebody, t my doctor told me, my friend told me, this nonprofit told me, it would be by the time you're 16, 20, 21, or whatever it is, and it's just false hope. Um, we do believe that a cure is right around the corner or else we wouldn't be funding the research that we are in the amounts that we are, right? I mean, that we want to fund more and more and more because we believe it's, it's coming and we want to see advancements any way that can look. But we will not promise a time frame because we have no, yeah. no idea. And that's just so unfair to a community that's already been through so much. Yeah. And, and, I, and kind of going back to what I, what I mentioned earlier, I, 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 I'd much rather have the, the reality of the situation as opposed to. And I think most people, people aren't children. They're smart. Yeah. They understand that when somebody's trying to sell them snake oil for the most part. I mean, I will say we, we are launching our organizational film and we filmed a 16 year old. We featured it. He got type one. He was diagnosed when he was in sixth grade, I believe. And he did say, you know, my doctor said he won't go to college with this disease. And now he's a senior and in high school. And so he's 17. And he said, I'm going to college next year. And there's, you know, there's no cure. And in his video, he was saying, that he had to have that moment as a, a teenager to say to himself, wait, I'm going to have this for the rest of my life. Because if I keep thinking it'll be, it'll be gone by college, you know, then I'm having this false hope and I need to learn how to live with this. And, and what does that look like? So I, I do see so many people in our community who have been told that and it, it's affected negatively. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you what guys, this was uh, fascinating. And I, I really appreciate it. And, and you, again, I'm I'm just a rock. I don't know science is not my, not me at all. And it's fascinating not only to learn just a little bit about the about the the research, but how you guys are and just how unique this situation is. So I'm I'm, I'm really glad that you were uh, able to explain it. And, and I think it's a important information to get out there. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we appreciate it. This is uh, no problem. No problem. So. Um, Casey Davis, C.C. King, it is the diabetesresearchconnection.org. And I'll finish off by saying if you're in the military, the police departments, fire departments, or first responders, if that's you out there, thank you very much for your service. Stay safe. Casey, C.C., thanks very much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, this is the Rain Man. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Rain Man's Take, Observations on the World We Live In. If you like the content, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. You can also follow Rain Man's Take on Instagram at Rain Man's Take. Also, check out our website at www.rainmanstakepodcast.com and send your comments to rainmanstake at gmail.com. Keep an eye out for future podcasts, which will be coming out every Thursday at 5 p.m. West Coast time.